Um, so today I'll talk about uh, linking actions to their sensory outcome. Um, and at a salient feature of any voluntary action is the underlying desire or link to consequences in the world. And unlike um, uh, reflexes that are stereotypical, uh, there are multiple ways in which the brain can uh, use its neural networks to connect between actions and uh, sensory consequences. So for example, if I want uh, to turn on the slides, I can use either my right or my left hand, or if I take an example from these uh, COVID days, uh, if in the past I used to open the door using the palm of my hand, today if I don't want to get infected, I will use my elbow instead. So there are different motor schemes that I can use to attain the same goal. Uh, and the flip side uh, is also correct, uh, meaning that I can use a particular motor scheme in order to achieve various uh, goals. So in this example, I can flick the switch and it can be either to turn on the light or to turn on the fan. So the motor scheme is exactly the same. The motor commands are the same, uh, but the desired consequence and the actual consequence in the world are completely different. Uh, so a major question uh, in neuroscience is how the brain links and what are the neural representations that allow us to flexibly integrate our actions to their sensory uh, consequences. Uh, so today I'll describe some of the works uh, that we have been doing in the lab. Uh, and I'll focus on two questions in this uh, regard. And the first is whether sensory regions are sensitive to motor attributes of the actions. And um, in the second part of my talk, uh, we look at the flip side, which is whether motor commands are sensitive to attributes of the evoked uh, stimulus. Okay, uh, so we'll start uh, with the direction from action to perception. And it has been shown in the literature that our voluntary actions can modulate uh, both neural activity uh, in sensory regions uh, and also our perception. And it, this has been shown in various animals from crickets to electric fish, uh, bats and monkeys. So if I take the example of the bat, but it's similar for the cricket. So when they uh, emit a sonar, they generate, they voluntarily generate um, uh, uh, sensory stimulus. Okay. Uh, at the same time, there's an attenuation of the neural activity in their uh, auditory cortex or the equivalent of that. Okay, and this attenuated response uh, is uh, several uh, tens of dB. Uh, and um, another example, this case uh, in uh, mice, here, what uh, we are looking at are the firing rates of neurons in the primary visual cortex of uh, mice uh, while they were uh, running on a treadmill in complete darkness. Okay, so these are neurons in primary visual cortex. Okay, there's no visual input. And you can see one example of a neuron that increases its firing rate as a function of the running speed. Uh, another neuron that decreases its firing rate as a function of running speed. So it's not just a matter of salience uh, or attention or vigilance. Uh, and a third neuron that has this preferred running speed. So I think this is a nice example showing how actions can modulate uh, neural activity in sensory regions. Uh, and in this case, even in the lack of a sensory stimulus. Okay. Uh, and these kind of modulations of how voluntary actions modulate uh, neural activity and perception uh, have been attributed to various functional uh, uh, roles, 
Uh, one of them is preserving the dynamic range of sensory processing. So when the bat emits these loud sonars, he doesn't want uh, his auditory cortex uh, to be saturated and to resealing. So therefore the motor commands somehow inhibit or attenuate the responses in the auditory cortex. Um, other theories ascribe these kind of modulations to uh, agency attribution, how uh, subjects attribute specific actions to this is me, and these are the consequences of my actions uh, versus the consequences of actions of someone else. And there is some evidence from schizophrenic patients where these kinds of modulations uh, are uh, reduced. Okay, and a, a prominent theory in motor control suggests that uh, the motor commands during the generation of voluntary movements sends commands not only to the effector producing the movement, uh, but also to the sensory regions that are associated with the consequences of uh, the action. So in the example I show here, so when I play the piano, uh, my motor cortex is active and it sends the motor commands uh, to the hand. But in parallel, it also sends what's called efferent copies uh, and modulates the neural activity in auditory cortex while expecting the reafferent signals from the piano. Okay. Uh, and when I hear... I am also listening to a lecture as we speak. I'll uh, make it. Ilana, mute yourself, please. Sorry, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Um, and if uh, I hear identical sounds uh, from an external source, okay, so there are no reference copies and the auditory cortex is not modulated by these kind of predictive signals. Uh, and therefore, the integration and interaction between the stimulus uh, and the neural activity in the auditory cortex is different in the active compared to the passive or self versus external uh, condition. Now, uh, given that the motor system is highly uh, lateralized, uh, we examined whether the um, hand or the effector that is used uh, in order to uh, generate the sounds will affect these kind of uh, modulations. And indeed, in a, a study that we published uh, a while ago, uh, we show uh, we had subjects play simple uh, piano uh, melodies. Uh, inside the fMRI scanner. And they played it either with the right hand or with their left hand. And they received binaural auditory uh, feedback. Uh, and we could record their playing and uh, do a replay. So in one block, they would generate the sound. And in other blocks, they would hear the consequences uh, that they generated. So in terms of the Auditory stimulus is identical in both cases. And the difference is between the active and passive conditions. And what we see is that in auditory cortex, both left and right, there is increased activity during the uh, self-generated sound, during the active uh, condition. But interestingly, we found that uh, these modulations were hand dependent. And what do I mean by that? So if we look at the left superior temporal gyrus, which is the equivalent of auditory cortex or high order auditory cortex, we see that uh, if we go for the left, that the signal, the fMRI signal was stronger when the subjects played with the right hand compared to when they played with their left hand, okay? And the flip side of this is when you look at the right superior temporal gyrus, the right auditory cortex, we see stronger signals when subjects played with their left hand compared to when they played with their right hand. 
okay? So we see that when the motor cortex, the engaged motor cortex and the auditory cortex are in the same hemisphere, we see stronger modulations. So when I play with my right hand, okay, my left auditory cortex is engaged and we see stronger modulations in left auditory cortex compared to if I played with my left hand. Uh, at the behavioral level, we saw um, also uh, an advantage for an ipsilateral configuration versus a contralateral configuration, meaning that uh, subjects had to detect the, these very soft sounds and we uh, measure their detection thresholds. So when the hand and the ear are on the same side, we see that the hearing thresholds are lower, meaning they hear better compared to when the hand and the ear are on opposite sides. And more recently, uh, we looked at these signals also using MEG at bar -Ilan together with um, Elana at uh, Golovic. And what we did here is subject press the button and 500 milliseconds later, it would generate a very soft uh, sound that's at their uh, hearing threshold, near their hearing threshold. Uh, and they did this with the right hand. And what we see compatible with what I showed earlier is that in the left auditory cortex, we see these motor evoked responses that are locked to the time when subjects pressed uh, the button to generate the sound, okay? And these motor locked responses are specific in left auditory cortex uh, versus right. Okay, so in right auditory cortex, we don't see this kind of modulation. So again, this brings us to this kind of model where we think that the engaged motor cortex sends these efferent copies or modulates the neural responses in sensory regions. And these modulations are stronger in uh, the cortex that resides with, uh, within the same hemisphere compared to across uh, hemispheres, okay? So this was in a auditory cortex. So more recently, um, together with, uh, so this is the model that uh, I mentioned. So during playing with a certain hand, we have the engaged motor cortex, okay? That modulates sensory activity uh, in sensory regions. And these modulations are stronger in the intrahemisphere versus the uh, interhemisphere. Uh, more recently, uh, together with Batel, a PhD student in the lab, we expanded this uh, also to uh, visual regions, visual domain. And what we did is the following. Uh, we presented, so here, again, we can manipulate the visual cortex that is stimulated. So we show these uh, circle patches um, to one visual field, either to the right or to the left either passively or actively. And what I mean by actively is that subjects had to generate these stimuli uh, by pressing a button and they press the button either with the right or the left hand. And the question is whether at the behavioral level we will see differential modulations that depend on the hand. And at the neural level using fMRI, whether visual cortex is sensitive to the hand that generated the stimulus. So just to remind you, the visual stimulus is identical whether subjects use the right or the left hand. So in theory, in principle, visual cortex should care less uh, which hand was used. Um, but what we think is that when subjects, for instance, in this case, use the right hand, so left motor cortex senses modulating signals to visual cortex, which in this case is the left visual cortex. But if they use their left hand, then the right motor cortex is engaged and these signals have to transfer through the corpus callosum and they might undergo some uh, modulation uh, resulting in different 
modulations of visual cortex that depend on the hand. So uh, what Batel did, she showed uh, subjects, this is a behavioral study at this stage, uh, subjects saw these uh, stimuli, these uh, circles uh, in one visual field, okay, in this case for the right, uh, they saw the stimuli, it disappeared, and then they had to press a button in order to generate another stimulus, and then they were asked which of the two stimuli was brighter, okay, uh, and except for some um, catch trials, they didn't know this, but on most of the trials, the stimuli were identical. So basically we forced them uh, to cheat uh, and to decide which of the two stimuli is uh, brighter um, and they have to report. Now, um, our index of modulation, what we saw eventually <clears throat> is that, um, some subjects report the active stimulus as brighter, and some uh, subjects report the stimuli as darker. There was no consistency in terms of the direction of the type of modulation between the active stimulus and the passive stimulus. But what we were interested in is the magnitude of the modulation and compare the magnitude of this modulation between the two hands within the same subjects, okay? So what we did is that uh, we take the proportion of times you say that the active uh, stimulus was uh, brighter uh, versus chance, okay? And compare this magnitude to the magnitude when you use the right hand, for example, and we compare this magnitude to uh, the same measure when subjects use their left hand. And what we see is that uh, for the both visual fields, we see stronger modulations when the hand and the visual field uh, were ipsilateral. Okay, so there's a uh, this is these are the group um, results and these are the individual subjects. So uh, the dashed line is the um, equality line. Okay, and you can see that most of the subjects, not all, but most of the subjects, have stronger modulations when the configuration of the visual field and the stimulus generating hand is ipsilateral compared to uh, contralateral. When we look at the uh, fMRI uh, results, so in the fMRI, we did not have a passive condition. We only had active conditions. And here we compared uh, generating stimuli, visual stimuli using the right hand or using the left hand in both visual fields. Uh, we did a localizer to localize, to define our uh, visual cortex. Uh, and as you can see, we have a nice separation of the right and left, for the right and left visual fields. And now the question is whether within this region of interest, we will see significant uh, modulations that differentiate between the right and the left hand. And I remind you that the visual stimulus is identical uh, in both cases. Uh, so in principle, visual cortex should be agnostic uh, to the hand. Uh, using standard GLM uh, methods, we don't see a significant uh, difference between right and left hands, but when using uh, machine learning uh, classification and decoding, what we see is that uh, voxels in visual cortex within this region of interest that I showed you uh, earlier, uh, allow significant classification of the hand that was used uh, to generate the stimulus. 
Now, uh, another thing that uh, we saw was that the significant voxels were not, were, were in both hemispheres. They were not particular to the visual field of the stimulus. So at first we thought, okay, when we show a stimulus in the right visual field, okay, so left visual, visual cortex is stimulated, and we would see most of our modulations in left visual cortex for right and left hand. But what we see is that also in the right visual cortex, we have significant voxels that uh, differentiate between the two hands, suggesting that even if we don't see a significant activation in the ipsilateral visual cortex, we see a significant modulations of the baseline signal uh, in this cortex. And what you see here on the right uh, are the classification levels uh, for all the voxels or the mean of all the voxels in our ROI versus the top voxels for the individual subjects. And uh, you can see that in both cases, it's very significant. And if we look at the top voxels, it's also pretty high. So, to sum this part, voluntary actions modulate perception of self-triggered uh, visual stimuli, uh, and they do so in a hand-dependent manner. And the neural representation of identical visual stimuli in visual cortex depends on the stimulus triggering hand. And basically what we show is just like the auditory cortex that I showed you earlier, visual cortex also knows what hand, what hand you use, despite the fact that the visual stimulation is identical. So maybe we should reconsider when we call it the visual cortex, it's also sensitive, sensitive to many other things. And I'll be happy to take questions along the talk, or if you want to keep them to the end. Because um, from, uh, from now, uh, I'll show uh, stuff that we haven't published yet. Uh, so I'll be happy to. Um, <clears throat> Roy, why do you think the differences between the auditory and the visual, the auditory is very clear, the differences in the, in the visual is much, uh, um, much more mixed between the hemispheres. And what do you think the source of the differences is? Yeah, so I think that the stimuli that we used, uh, it engages not only the contralateral um, uh, hemisphere, okay, but both hemispheres. If we do a contrast of right visual field versus left visual field, then we get this clear, clear cut separation, right? Mm -hmm. But if I do a contrast of right visual field stimulation versus rest, then we will see enhanced activity in the left visual cortex, but we will see also enhanced activity in the right visual, in the ipsilateral visual cortex, okay? And like in the auditory cortex, we saw that there are modulations both in the right and left auditory cortex, okay? Uh, but stronger modulations in the ipsil hemispheric uh, side, okay. Uh, so here we see modulations in both visual cortices. Um, we didn't examine magnitude or compare magnitude between the right and the left, but in this sense, it's compatible uh, with the auditory results. Um, in the, I want to mention also that in the auditory um, study, they had binaural stimulation. So we stimulated both cortices, okay? So here, to begin with, our visual stimuli were only in one visual field. So I assume that uh, neural signals in the ipsilateral visual cortex were to begin with uh, lower or weaker, mm -hmm. okay? Unlike in the auditory cortex where we stimulated both ears, okay? Uh, but the fact that we see these kind of modulations suggests that the engaged motor cortex modulates both visual cortices. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Wait, could I? Mm -hmm. So 
So th there are sensory modalities that are actually uh, required for completion of the motor act. So the, their, their, their feedback is necessary for the successful completion of the motor act. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I mean, uh, uh, the airframe copy is actually needed for the motor act to be successful. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that the airframe copy is, so, so what you see, is that a byproduct of those modalities receiving the airframe copy? Or is it sped over to all uh, uh, regions of the brain, some of them need it, some of them don't need it. Is there any distinction between modalities, ones that are needed and ones that are not needed? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question that we are also, so how general and how specific is the signal, right? So if I engage a left motor cortex and I'm now in a visual task, will it also modulate activity in auditory cortex? Right, that's, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, we studied something similar with uh, Danielle uh, a while ago, uh, where we had uh, subjects uh, generate either visual or uh, auditory uh, stimuli and not conclusive, uh, but it seemed that the signals were specific meaning the modulations were specific to the relative domain. But um, take it with a grain of salt at this stage, okay? Um, so, so far I talked about perception and now I would like to talk about uh, learning, okay? Uh, so there are various ways uh, to learn. Uh, we can learn by observing others, uh, and we examine uh, what happens when you learn from observing a right hand or a left hand, and we manipulated the size of the hand using virtual reality, and we show that learning from controlling a bigger hand can enhance um, the learning curve. Uh, we also examined how, whether and how passive movement can facilitate learning. Uh, and using a passive movement device, we show that uh, it facilitates uh, beyond observation. And there's also uh, intermanual transfer, which is uh, training with one hand that uh, facilitates the performance of the non-trained hand. So I'll spare you the movie of Inigo Montoya from uh, uh, the Bri Princess Bride, but basically he fences using his left hand and then he switches seamlessly to his right hand. Uh, so basically we're able to transfer skills from one hand to the other. And the study I want to present to you uh, now uh, we examined the lateral configuration between the active hand and the stimulated sensor, okay? So I showed you earlier that when it comes to perception, uh, we see hand-dependent uh, modulations both at the neural activity and at the be behavioral level. Uh, so here we wanted to examine whether this lateral configuration between the hand and the sensory regions that are stimulated, whether this can affect learning. Um, so what we did is the following. Uh, we had subjects train on a simple um, melody, uh, an eight note sequence, and they had to play it precisely with an interpress interval of 300 milliseconds. So that was their aim, to play it as precisely as uh, possible. And we had four experimental groups. We had two hands and two ears. So 30 subjects in each group, they either trained with the right hand and they received feedback to their right ear or another group trained with the right hand and received feedback to the left ear and similarly for the left hand. So, during training, so first they get the instructions to play this sequence on the piano. Uh, and during training, 
uh, they uh, receive monaural feedback and they play with one of their hands, depending on the group. And they also receive feedback from a metronome. So they have to squeeze in these eight notes within two bits of the metronome. Okay, that gives them an external cue and feedback of their performance. And within these two beats, they have to play eight notes with exactly a 300 millisecond interpress interval. That's their task. Okay, and they train uh, for uh, two days on this task. And we measure their uh, performance, which I'll explain in a second. And we also examine generalization. Generalization is your ability to perform the same task or similar task under different conditions. So uh, in the generalizations, we had two types. One type was without an external cue. So this time we uh, turn off the metronome and we give them binaural feedback and we ask them to perform the sequence as accurately as possible with this 300 millisecond IPI. Um, so they do this with their uh, trained hand. And another type of generalization is uh, what we call intermanual transfer. So if you were in the group of the right hand, right ear, so now we test you uh, using your left hand, binaural stimulation and no metronome. Okay, so it's transferred to the non-trained hand. And we examine their performance of these generalization tasks before and after the main training session. Okay. Uh, and in terms of data analysis, so uh, we look, this is the sequence, and we look at the interpress interval between each pair of uh, buttons, uh, of uh, keystrokes. So in principle, uh, if they have exactly 300 milliseconds between two notes, then the uh, uh, difference between the interpress interval and 300 milliseconds is zero, which is perfect. But of course, subjects are not perfect. And in some cases, the interpress interval between two buttons can be more or sometimes less than the requested uh, IPI. And uh, note the following. So if uh, between a pair of notes, the difference is 350 and another pair of notes, the difference is 250, then in principle, the average difference uh, would be zero. Uh, so for this reason, we use the absolute of this difference. So it's basically the distance of the interpress interval from perfect uh, performance. So we look at the absolute of the ITI minus 300 and of course, error tries are discarded uh, because there's post-error uh, slowing. Uh, and very large RPIs are also uh, discarded as outliers. And what we see here is the following. So these are, this is the learning curve of one group, 30 subjects that trained with their left hand and received auditory feedback to their left ear. So we, we can see that they started at a distance of around 60 milliseconds from perfect performance. I remind you, zero is perfect. And there's a learning curve. There's also offline gains between the first day and uh, the second day. And in general, they improve and plateau around 30, 35 milliseconds uh, delta IPI, okay? So now, uh, just for the sake of it, uh, what would you um, guess would be the result compared to the other groups, the contralateral? Would it be better or worse? Better. There are three options. <laughs> I'm guessing better. Sorry? I'm guessing better. Better. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so the bottom line is that we see for the left hand uh, contralateral uh, ear, so it's left hand, right ear, uh, they start around the same, they improve just like the ipsilateral, 
but they end up much better than the ipsilateral condition, okay? So at this stage, uh, uh, corona hit us hard and we had only half of the data. So we couldn't distinguish between whether this is an effect of maybe the right ear is better than the left ear or whether the, really the configura configural relationship between hand and ear is what plays a role. So we had to wait, but eventually uh, Hadar and Bethel, they managed to uh, complete the study with two more groups with right hand. Uh, so this is the ipsilateral condition. And this is the contralateral condition. And in the first day, they're pretty much the same. But in the second day, you can see that the uh, ipsilateral condition is worse than the contralateral condition. Okay, and if we quantify this, this is the average across days. We see a main effect of ipsilateral feedback uh, versus contralateral, such that contralateral feedback is better uh, and closer to perfect performance compared to the ipsilateral uh, feedback. What about uh, transfer? So I remind you, during transfer, uh, they received feedback to both ears, but there were, this time there was no uh, metronome. Uh, so on the first day, there's no difference between the two uh, conditions. You can see that the left hand is worse than the right hand uh, in both uh, conditions. Uh, and and we, when we look at the second day, uh, there was no main effect of Ipsy versus Contra, but there was an interaction such that we see a similar effect only in the left hand, meaning that in the left hand, the contralateral configuration was much better than the ipsilateral configuration. In the right hand, there was no sig significant difference, okay? And a similar result was found in the other type of transfer, namely generalization to the non-trained hand, okay? So this is the uh, performance of the non-trained hand on the first day. And on the second day, so uh, note the reduction, the great reduction in the Delta IPI. So there is significant transfer of learning. They managed to generalize uh, and transfer the knowledge from the trained hand to the non-trained hand. And once again, we see that in the groups that trained with the left hand, okay, there is significantly better transfer uh, in the uh, Ipsy versus uh, the contra, sorry, the, the contra versus the Ipsy condition. Meaning that in the left-hand groups, the, the group that trained with the right here uh, performed better later on with the right hand compared to the group that trained with the left hand and left here configuration. And again, in the right hand, we didn't see a significant uh, difference um, we don't have a real explanation for that. Maybe in general, the right hand is better. There's some kind of floor effect or something like that. So we see that at the level of perception, there are stronger modulations when sensory and motor activity are biased to the same hemisphere. Uh, but when it comes to learning, we see that learning is better uh, when the sensory and the motor activity are biased to uh, different hemispheres, okay? And, and now it's an open question that we are, we, we plan to pursue is to examine the mechanism, uh, the neural mechanism uh, behind this effect. And some avenues uh, from uh, the literature. So we and others have shown that during active generation of sounds, uh, the sounds uh, are attenuated, are perceived as uh, less uh, strong. So it could be that these modulations that are within uh, hemisphere somehow affect and um, interfere with the learning process. Uh, we know uh, from uh, the literature that su subjects in general 
are faster to respond uh, when the stimulus and the hand are in the same side. Okay, so if the visual stimulus is on the right side, uh, subjects are uh, faster uh, to respond. Sorry, when they respond with the right hand, they are faster to respond to visual stimuli that are on the right versus the left, uh, suggesting that actually within the same hemisphere, connections allow faster uh, responses. But this is for simple responses to uh, stimuli. Uh, but when it comes to generation and learning, uh, it could be that, uh, and this is compatible uh, with some theories of consciousness, that the more activity you get in uh, the spread of activity across cortical regions and between hemispheres, the, uh, there's a nicer correlation with conscious perception. So it could be that when we engage motor, motor systems and sensory systems in different hemispheres, somehow this extra cross -talk, talk between the hemispheres allows better uh, learning. And some supportive evidence uh, comes from uh, uh, other studies looking at uh, presentation of stimuli, either within the same side or across uh, the different uh, hemifields. And what they show is that for word matching and face matching tasks, uh, there's uh, what they call the bilateral processing advantage. So if people are faster at uh, completing such tasks when the stimuli presented to the two hemispheres rather than the same hemisphere. And this bilateral processing advantage increases as the task becomes harder. Okay, so it could be that responses to stimuli are faster because it's a simple stimulus response. But when it comes to integration and learning, then increased crosstalk between hemispheres actually is necessary to facilitate uh, the learning process. And there is also some evidence in terms of functional connectivity, suggesting that indeed, increased functional connectivity between hemispheres can facilitate such learning. So this is an avenue that uh, we plan to continue and examine using neural measures. Uh, so far, we only examined it at the behavioral level. So I hope that I convinced you that sensory regions are sensitive uh, to motor attributes of, of actions. And now I want to show you um, some uh, studies uh, showing that motor commands are sensitive to attributes of the uh, evoked stimulus. So if we go from perception uh, to action or from perception to neural activity in a motor cortex, so uh, fMRI studies and of course the original studies in primates have shown the existence of mirror neurons, uh, activations to both observed and performed actions. And during my postdoc, uh, I recorded these types of, directly these types of neurons uh, from the supplementary motor cortex of uh, epileptic patients. But these are, sensor, these are responses to uh, sensory stimuli that are not the consequence of actions of the, of the self. It's perceiving actions that other people have uh, performed. So the question is whether motor cortex is sensitive also to the sensory consequences that uh, the observer or the perceiver generates. Uh, and the hallmark of motor preparation signal is the, what's called the Bereichshaft potential or readiness potential, uh, already described in the late 60s. Uh, so these are uh, EEG signals uh, showing increased uh, ramp up of activity uh, just before uh, a voluntary movement. In this case, it's uh, simple button presses. Uh, and uh, 
I've shown this also using uh, uh, single neuron uh, recordings in similar setups that I described uh, earlier with epileptic patients. So these are uh, raster plots or histograms of neural activity ramping up before a voluntary uh, button press. Okay, and at the individual neuron level, we see that subpopulation increased their firing rates, and the subpopulation uh, mixed subpopulation decreased their firing rate. And, and these neurons are mostly in the medial frontal lobe, and the, this ramping activity is very robust, even allowing prediction of future movement already at 70%, already a second before uh, movement, okay? So this is a salient preparatory motor activity, predominantly uh, motor activity. And the question is whether this kind of signal encodes also sensory consequences of the action, okay? So uh, here using EEG, not intracranial, scalp EEG together with Daniel Resnick, uh, subjects, had to press buttons um, and one button generated a sound and the other uh, was silent. And of course we counterbalance the condition. And what we tell them is that whenever uh, you want, press a button, whichever button you want. Uh, so every two or three seconds they press a button. And if they press the button that generates a sound, they will hear a sound. And if they press the other, it would, um, be silent. And we also had a condition in which they only heard the sounds with no voluntary movement. And when we look at the EEG signal, uh, so the orange is the response to the sound only condition, the passive condition. So you see that there's no preparatory motor activity. The red is the motor only condition. Okay. And the blue is the motor plus sound. So here you can see uh, significantly different readiness potential when they know that they're expecting a sound as a consequence of their button press. And of course, conditions are counterbalanced. So it's always we compare within the same finger conditions with sound and without sound. Okay, so this suggests that the readiness potential, a preparatory, predominantly preparatory motor activity, is sensitive to the expected sensory consequences of the action. Now, because this is uh, such a motor activity, predominantly motor activity, uh, together with Daniel, we said, okay, let's just verify, just to make sure that indeed there's no difference also in the motor uh, properties of the button press in terms of kinematics or... So like in the uh, sensory domains where we made sure that the sensory stimuli are identical in both active and passive conditions or across conditions that we compare, we wanted to verify that here the kinematics are the same. And to our surprise, and here we started an adventure, uh, we realized that subjects uh, induce um, differential force to press the button as a function of whether it generates sounds or not. Okay, yeah, so now I'll show you uh, a study together with uh, Batel, where we examined um, this issue uh, in more detail. So uh, subjects had to uh, press these uh, buttons, but this time we measured force and one button generated uh, a salient sound and the other one a faint sound. So we basically uh, played with the uh, amplitude or intensity of the generated sound. And the subjects knew in advance which button corresponds to which uh, sound. And of course, at a certain stage, we flip 
the mapping and we tell them about it uh, just to make sure that we're not tapping onto differences in force between fingers. We want to compare within the same finger what happens or what pressure you apply when you generate uh, salient sound or high intensity versus low intensity. Um, and in another condition, we randomized this mapping such that any button press would at 50% of the time generate either a loud sound or a soft sound, okay? So any difference that we see will be specific to this uh, explicit mapping. What we see, so here are the uh, trajectories of the force. So this is in the faint condition, okay? Uh, the black line represents the duration of the stimulus, the auditory stimulus, okay? And uh, this is for the generator uh, faint condition. And if we look at the salient condition, we see that subjects uh, exert uh, less force when they know that they're about uh, to generate a more salient uh, stimulus. Now, just to clarify, both the salient and the faint uh, stimuli were audible. The salient was uh, comfortable. It's not um, aversive uh, at any stage. And the faint stimuli are well above hearing threshold. So they can hear them on 100% of the time. What happens in the random condition? So when they don't, they press a button, but they have no idea what will be the intensity. Uh, so what we see here, uh, the light color is for the faint condition and the dark color is for the salient condition. So we see there is also a difference between uh, these uh, conditions in the random uh, configure, um, condition. But this difference says arise much later compared to uh, the explicit knowledge when they know that this button generates a high intensity versus a low intensity, okay? And what we found is that while the difference in the uh, knowledge condition is significant already in the first 100 milliseconds, in the random condition, is, it is only much later. And since the difference in the random condition could be, this late difference could be due to uh, reafference uh, signals. So they press and they already have sufficient time to process the stimulus uh, and then they adjust their force. So in order to avoid uh, any reference signals, we focus on the first 100 milliseconds. Okay, where we see that uh, reafferent uh, doesn't play an issue. Okay, and if we look at the area under the curve for the uh, different conditions, we compare the faint intensity sounds versus the salient intensity sounds. These are the individual subjects. The dashed line is the equality line. Okay, we see that for the majority of subjects, okay, their values are below the line, meaning that the area under the curve for faint intensities is stronger, they press stronger in the faint condition versus the salient condition. Okay, this is when they know the mapping, the explicit, they have explicit knowledge about the mapping between the buttons and the stimuli. And in the random condition, uh, these are the individual subjects, and you can see that they're all on the equality line. Okay, so this suggests that uh, explicit knowledge of the forthcoming uh, intensity of the sound modulates our motor behavior. Okay, despite the fact that uh, the stimuli were all fixed. 
and the buttons are all uh, fixed and they, the subjects know that there's no relationship between the amount of pressure uh, and the uh, intensity of the sound. Okay, so it's just like I press the keyboard, when I press the J button, um, it doesn't matter if I press it hard or soft, it will generate uh, the same stimulus, J on the screen. So in uh, follow-up, we examine the role of causality. Is it critical that I be the generator of the sound or rather uh, this represents some kind of uh, unit between actions and percepts? So to examine the role of causality, uh, we basically performed, uh, again, the experiment I showed you earlier, the generating stimulus, but also had in these subjects uh, a different condition in, where, in which they had to respond to either the salient stimuli or the high intensity or the low intensity according to the mapping. Okay, and the mapping was reversed uh, midway. Okay. Um, in addition, we examined, we expanded this not only to the auditory modality, but also to the visual modality. So we had this time also low contrast, high contrast, and also in the tactile modality. So we had vibrotactile sensors. Uh, so either it's like on your cell phone, you, when you put it on mute, uh, so you have either soft vibrations or stronger vibrations on the other hand. And uh, for across all modalities, these are 72 subjects, 24 in each modality group. This is the time course of the uh, force, the applied force uh, for the uh, faint conditions. And this is for the salient condition. Okay, so we basically replicate this time across three modalities, uh, what we found earlier in the auditory modality. So when you expect a soft sound, you apply stronger pressure uh, on the button implicitly um, compared to when you know that uh, you will receive a salient uh, feedback. What happens in the uh, follower condition? So two things. First, you see that subjects in general press stronger when they uh, hear a sound and then have to press. And the second thing, the important thing is that there's no difference between uh, the faint and the salient conditions. And this is not a um, ceiling effect, okay? Uh, and this in a sense is a bit compatible because when they are in the following condition, they press the button, but they receive no feedback. Okay, so just like earlier, uh, like in the soft condition or the uh, faint condition, they press stronger as a function uh, of uh, reduced uh, feedback. Uh, and if we look at the individual modalities, so this is the breakup, 24 subjects in each condition. So we replicated our auditory results from earlier. In the tactile condition, uh, it, was, it failed to reach significance, 0 0.07. These are the individual subjects. So what you see here are the differences. So for each subject, we compute uh, the difference in the area under the curve between the faint and the salient uh, conditions. So in the auditory condition, you see most of the subjects are above zero, meaning they press stronger in the faint condition. Uh, this is the tactile condition. So uh, as I said, uh, it was close to significant. Maybe if you take out these two, well, we know if you take out these two, then it becomes significant, uh, but we have no particular reason uh, to remove them, but you can see that most of the subjects have a positive difference. And in the uh, visual condition, we see no difference. Uh, and if we look at the follower conditions, so first of all, note the change in scale. Subjects press much stronger in, this, in the 
follower condition, but there is no significant difference for the two intensity uh, conditions. Okay. And our current explanation for, so we expand our results from auditory to tactile condition. Uh, our current explanation for the visual domain is that usually there is no mapping or relationship between the intensity of our movement and contrast, which is opposed to auditory domain. So if I hit the drum uh, stronger, then I will receive increased auditory feedback. Um, in the visual domain, and, and the same for tactile, in the visual domain, the connection between pressure and um, contrast is less uh, direct. So what uh, we are running now is uh, the visual uh, condition, but not with stimuli of different contrast, but moving stimuli. So like um, the optic flow, uh, but in this case, we are using uh, the bores that will move at either a slow rate or a fast rate. Um, and we will see whether in this case, uh, there is a relationship between the speed of the stimulus and the implicit force that subjects use to press the button. And uh, the final experiment in this uh, series, we examine the relationship between applied force and perception. So like I said, subjects for some reason implicitly press stronger when they know that the expected stimulus is faint. So we wanted to see whether there is any behavioral advantage to pressing stronger when you know that um, the upcoming stimulus is faint. So what we did here in the auditory domain, we estimated the hearing thresholds of subjects, okay? And after we reached their uh, thresholds, or they're at 50%, we asked them to do a detection task. So uh, they hear sounds. Uh, on 50% of the trials, there is a sound. On 50% of the trials, there is no sound. And they have to um, uh, report uh, whether they detected uh, the sound. So these are uh, self-triggered uh, sounds. Um, and what we see here is the following. So they generate the sounds, and of course, the force they apply um, can change between trials. So we want to see whether there is a relationship between the applied force on specific trials and their detection uh, rate. So first of all, our uh, hearing threshold uh, worked and subjects. So whenever there was a sound, there were around 50% hits and misses, okay? Um, so at least our hearing detection threshold uh, worked. But when we looked at the applied force on the hit trials or the missed trials, so in all of these trials, there is a sound, okay? Uh, so if there is any perceptual advantage to pressing stronger, um, there doesn't seem uh, to be such. Okay, and here on the right, you see the average force that the subjects applied on the hit and miss trials. Uh, and these are the individual subjects. Again, the dashed line is the equality line. So to summarize, um, we see that the sensory attributes of expected sensory outcome uh, modulate action kinetics. Uh, subjects use more force to trigger low versus high intensity stimuli. A causal relationship between the action and the stimulus is necessary for such modulations. We don't see them when the causal relationship is flipped. And this is a question that uh, I get a lot, um, whether there is any functional relevance, like in the bats. So there are these theories that these modulations may maintain the dynamic range of the sensory stimulus uh, or agency attribution, okay? So at least when it comes to sound detection, we don't see an apparent uh, functional role. 
Uh, but I still think that these kind of modulations, even if we don't find a functional role or behavior at the behavioral level, they can be indicative of the underlying mechanisms of how the brain integrates uh, actions with their sensory consequences. So uh, that's why I think that even without a behavioral um, uh, correlate, uh, these kind of modulations uh, might be uh, interesting to look at. Um, so, just a quick, uh, can I just a quick comment about the the final point? I wouldn't be. I mean, there there is a chance that this null result is uh, of, of the third point, the last point, because if I understand correctly, you measured that uh, around threshold, right? The it sounds that they're around threshold. Yes. Yeah. So. I think sometimes uh, there are many cases where measuring such things uh, and, and trying to find the correlation around the thresholds is, is uh, tricky. So I would try uh, to try and repeat this also above thresholds. It might be that you get more uh, clearer effects there because uh, the, the whole threshold, uh, exact threshold thing is, uh, is tricky because it's, there's a lot of noise there as well. So, and what would would be your behavioral measure? So here it's detection. So it, it, there is a sound, there is no sound. So if it's well above threshold, no, you can still do a detection experiment, but uh, but have it uh, slightly above threshold, so that uh, less noise. There's less noise there, um, because if you're around threshold, then in some of the trials because the threshold estimation is never accurate. And right. some of the trials there are below threshold, which means you are measuring noise. So uh, if you go at least uh, to some extent above threshold, you reduce the noise and maybe you'll see some effects there. You can still do a detection experiment, even if it's, a, if it's above threshold. It's above. So you mean here, not to bring them to 50, but to bring them to 70. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, tricky methodologically. I would. Uh, uh, I mean, it's many you can because if I if I saw correctly, you did a two to one straight staircase procedure, so you can do a different staircase procedure and get a, um, and go above threshold by that, and then that will be the the anchor that you measure. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, in general, uh, so in monkeys, in bats, in crickets, the difference between these modulations, these attenuations mostly, uh, are pretty strong, are several dBs. Mm. Um, both uh, our results and results from other uh, groups in the literature, the effects in humans are much, much smaller. Um, so we're talking about a difference of one, two dB, okay? Um, so it could be that in animals, the behavioral relevance or the functional um, relevance of these kind of modulations are different uh, because I, I don't believe that this one dB difference between active and passive helps me uh, know that I am the agent. Uh, or it doesn't help me maintain the dynamic range of my auditory cortex. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just too small of an effect to have any functional significance, uh, which is different than what's reported in electric fish, uh, monkeys and bats. Uh, so it, it's an open mm -hmm. question still. Um, and just, um, so hopefully I convince you that motor commands are sensitive to attributes of the evoked stimulus. And just to show you that 
uh, the motor commands uh, code uh, not only stimul uh, the evoke stimulus, uh, they can also uh, encode uh, more abstract things like semantic meaning. And this is a project that uh, we recently published with uh, Shaha from the lab, where uh, we kept the sensory consequences um, uh, identical across conditions. Subjects had to press buttons uh, to respond either yes or no uh, to simple uh, uh, questions. Uh, and basically what we manipulate is the semantic meaning of the action. So let's say I go to the General Assembly uh, and someone asks all those in favor and I can raise my hand. And then he asks a different question and all of those uh, against. Okay, I can also raise my hand. So the motor commands are identical. Okay, but the semantic meaning behind these motor commands is completely different. Okay, and the question is whether uh, and how uh, the neural representations of these semantic meanings uh, are in the brain. Uh, so now that we have experienced that there might be differences in the applied pressure, so we examined uh, the applied pressure when subjects press to respond yes or no. Uh, and of course, there are differences between the hands. So in general, subjects uh, use uh, apply more force with the right hand compared to the left hand. But in both cases, we saw no difference uh, within the hands when they respond yes or no. And then when we look at uh, the brain uh, using uh, multivoxel uh, pattern analysis, uh, we find regions in the precentral, the uh, um, parietal cortex, premotor and parietal cortex that are sensitive to the semantic meaning of the action. So what you see here in light blue is differentiation of hand identity. And what you see in dark blue are significant voxels uh, differentiating with, it's within the same okay, motor commands but different semantic meanings, okay? And so this was my last uh, slide. Uh, so um, we are now uh, looking uh, or exploring the interaction uh, between actions uh, and their sensory consequences. And uh, Together with Jason and Shlomit in the lab, we are trying to modulate uh, learning processes in visual cortex uh, using uh, different hands and uh, motor tasks. Okay. Uh, so this will end. Okay. Thank uh, to. Uh, uh, but El and Shachar, uh, PhD students in the lab, uh, Hadar, where I showed this data with the uh, uh, piano playing, uh, and uh, some alumni, uh, mostly uh, Ori and uh, Daniel, uh, whose data I've shown uh, with respect to the learning and uh, modulations.